like the little at the corner. Yeah. Hey, Aaron Sanders, this Agile guy. And today I am joined with recovering project manager, Joel. Hey, Joel, how are you tonight? I'm good, Aaron. How are you? Doing terrific. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. It's almost almost New Year's. Um, I'm very happy to put 2020 in the rearview mirror. Me too. Absolutely. Anything over this last year that springs to mind that maybe we could start talking about working with Agile or in an Agile fashion? You know, it, it, the way you ask that question, it's actually one of those things I, I prognosticated um, to my coworkers, I think, on this, and I, I really want to write about it in the new year. I, with 2020, the year of COVID, the year of everyone being remote, whether you like it or not, it's like, remember how you kept saying, I want to work remote, I want to work remote? Be careful what you wish for. But with all of that, working with, um, with customers and working with people, this whole concept of co-location has kind of gotten thrown out the door for the time being. And we have to start thinking about that. It's like, what is that going to look like in the future? And I predict that there is a new term that we're going to start seeing as we move forward, and that's co-time zone. Because as we've figured this out, and I kind of was seeing it more also because we're seeing this um, people moving away from the cities and trying to go to more country life like you and I. We're both mm -hmm. um, California ex expats at this point. Um, it's like, great, you can work remotely. What you can't do, though, is work remotely when you've got one team member in California, one team member in Indianapolis, two team members in India, and somebody in Poland. It's like, no, you don't have enough overlap. So it's something I'm actually working with people and working with clients right now of the let's co-time zone. Let no more than two hours spread, no more than two, two time zone differences for everybody in the team. Makes sense. And that's the so big takeaway. you and I... We could work together. You're on Pacific. I'm on yep. Mountain. We overlap a lot of hours, but maybe not Bangalore, 12 hours away. That's what you're Definitely saying. Definitely not Bang Bangalore, yeah. If there's a team composed like that, do you have some recommendations to help out? Yeah. I mean, I... I faced this, so I, I worked for this company for a while as an Agile coach that you've probably never heard of. It's called the AOL. Um, used to be a joke that I could say, yes, they still exist, but no, actually, they, 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 they were absorbed by your old company, Yahoo, and then both of them were, AOL was bought by Verizon. Verizon let AOL run as an independent entity, and then, AOL, then Verizon bought Yahoo, and they were going to merge them together, and then Yahoo lost, a, what was it, a billion email addresses? And, Three so, billion, I think. Three yeah. billion, yes, a um, lot. But they merged AOL and Yahoo, and that went so well that they went, okay, this isn't working, and then they merged all into Verizon Media. Um, but at AOL, we had teams in India, and we had teams in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, and then we actually had teams in Argentina. Okay. And the challenge we had was the Argentina teams, there was enough overlap that we were able to work. And there were, there were some teams where we had people in Argentina and in, in, in the Bay Area. Um, the India teams though, when they, early on, they tried to have people in, in, in the Bay Area and people in India and it just wasn't working. Somebody was always suffering. And so we moved, we reorganized the teams and after the reorganizing, with the exception of, I think, one team, all the teams were in the same location. So if you were in Argentina, you were working with other people in Argentina. If you were in San Mateo, in the Bay Area, you were working with people in San Mateo. If you were in India, you were working with people in India. The only person that didn't, didn't, didn't win in this was the product owner, because at the time, we didn't have enough product owners for one product, every, product owner every team. Mm -hmm. And this product owner was responsible for supply. And we had one team for supply in India and one team for supply in San Mateo. So this poor gentleman, what we what what we did with for him was he came in at like ten o'clock in the morning. He'd work for three or four hours in in San Mateo. He'd go home. He'd take a nap, and then he'd get up and he'd work for th for four hours with his India team. 
Um, and that's how we structured that. But having all of the people in the same time zone really, really helped. I'm sure. And this idea of fully staffed teams in each area. So AOL being big enough, I'm sure there are enough personnel in each area, which is something surprising to me, how often larger organizations say, what, seven people in Bengal are working together? Are you nuts? Well, don't you have hundreds there? Uh, what, are, what are some ways for organizations to look at that and figure out how to create those fully staffed teams? Um, I think part of it is it's that regionalization and it's the, I mean, the first thing is really getting people to understand that concept of the, the, the T-shaped engineer. And I mean, it's still a term that I still get people like looking at me like funny, like, what do you mean? And I mean, T-shaped engineer, the concept is an I-shaped engineer. They're really good at just one thing. It's, they're really deep in one thing. They're, they're great at, uh, at database. Oh my goodness, they're, they're actually great at Oracle database. The concept of, of a T-shaped engineer is that while you're really great at one thing, you're, you're really great at that database, you also know some, some UI stuff, you also know some business logic stuff. And so you can kind of put together some stuff to, um, on that. So that's one concept is the, the T-shaped engineers. I think the other concept is just size. I mean, so many people go, oh, well, we need these eight people. And it's like, do you? Um, and I, I mean, I find them coming in and it's like they're stretching the limits and it's like they got 12, 13, 14 people. And it's like, I go, okay, let's let's split this now. The easy, easiest, the easy way here is like, you've got people spread across three time zones. Let's make two teams. And now we're spread across only one team spread across two time zones and one team is completely within the same time zone. Yeah, sure. And those overlapping time zones you were talking about. Yeah. Was, go ahead. No, I was agreeing with you. Oh, okay. Well, good. I'm glad we're in agreement. Uh, let's check in just for a second, see if we have any questions. Let's see if I can find the chat and just say hello to people out there. Hello. Ask us questions because this is supposed to be Ask us anything. So maybe that'll happen. But for now, it's you and me. Now, before we went live, you were telling me a little bit about your journey from project manager to certified team coach. Anything about that you'd like to address uh, yeah how'd you I do guess that how'd you move from project manager into this agile space with great great amount of pain and suffering and angst oh, no. i actually yeah. I, I i was a really really good project manager i was a project management professional i really good at my job i got headhunted for my 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 skills and ability I had a, I, I was a niche specialist in project management around customer support organizations, and dang, I was good. And in February, second uh, February, of, um, sorry, second Tuesday of the month in February 2009 at the Belmont IHOP in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, um, I was at the PMI networking breakfast and. Chris Sims, who is a um, uh, certified scrum trainer like yourself, uh, showed up because he was um, promoting his, his, his workshops. And Ainsley Nees, who I think you know as well, a dear, dear friend of mine, was facilitating the meeting. She introduced herself, and then Chris introduced himself. And then we went around the table, and there were like 15 people. And every single person had something to say about Agile because Chris had gone first. Like, oh, there's this scrum guy here and everything. And then it got to me. And I looked around the table and I said, my name is Joel Bancroft Connors and you will pry waterfall from my cold, dead hands. I was terrified of Agile, absolutely terrified. Everything I'd seen about Agile made me terrified. I'm a real, I was a really, really good project manager. That's it. Like a lot, not, unlike a lot of people in, in the Agile, early Agile community, I had no development chops. I didn't even stay in a Holiday Inn Express. Okay. I was 
project manager. That's it. That's it. And so Agile scared the hell out of me. It's like, where's my job? What am I going to do? And yeah. so I was just totally resistant because of the fear. Okay. For job security, was that the root of the fear? Yeah, I guess it was, it was job, mostly it was job security. And it's like, well, what am I going to do? And it's like, if there's no, I mean, you look at it, it's like, there's no project manager in there. Where's the project manager? And mm -hmm. from what I'd seen in my limited experiences with Agile, which turns out they weren't Agile and it was really bad. It, I didn't, I didn't equate that a scrum master was a project manager. So by the way, psst, they're not. They're not. Um, and so for me, it was just, I don't see this. I, 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 I don't even want to look at it. I didn't even want to consider it. It's much like a mindset of some of the people that um, we've run into in the, in this era of 2020. I don't even want to consider this. Okay. My, my views are so set. I won't even consider thinking about this. Interesting. So you're talking a little bit about mindset and it sounds like that fixed mindset that you knew the cert with, with certainty what the world is like. And then here comes along Agile. And you're absolutely how, right. How did you change your mind? Fixed mindset. Yeah. yeah. How did you open up that mindset and be a little more open to learning? And I would imagine making a mistake or two as you moved from project manager. So I, I don't suppose you, you do remember that? what was happening in the world in 2009. Oh, let me think. Gosh, was there anything before this year? Yeah, I think so. There's like a financial crisis. Uh, yeah, um, September 30th. It was a year of, uh, of dates to remember. September 30th, um, I went into a 9 a.m. all hands. And at 9.45, I was standing around with 150 other people holding my walking papers. Oh, boy. Didn't see it coming. Really? Did not see it coming at all. Laid off in the height of the recession, totally dumbfounded. And I was I was kind of panicking. And I as I was doing job searching, I started listening to um, the PMO podcast by Cornelius Fitchner. And I started hearing some things about Agile and it's like, okay, maybe. And then Chris Sims actually contacted me out of the blue. Turns out he'd actually talked to Ainsley who knew where I, my situation because I'd been at a networking thing. And he was holding a Scrum Master workshop and he was offering unemployment discounts. And this was December of 2009. And I saw the writing on the walls as I was looking at all this. And it's like CSM was this big thing of people wanted to see it on your resume. And it's like, so I went to Chris's class with two and only two goals. Goal number okay. one, get a piece of paper so I could put CSM on my resume. Goal number two, Prove that this is a bunch of hogwash and is, isn't real. I got the you, CSM. <laughs> and what happened to a hogwash? You remind me of James Shore. He says, there's no way extreme programming can work. I'm going to go prove it. It can't work. And of course, he wrote Art of Agile and is now writing the second version of that book. So... What happened? I uh, couldn't disprove it. I couldn't. Um, so I, I got a really unique opportunity. Chris Sims is a really great um, trainer. Um, he was doing Absolutely. training from the back of the room type stuff before anybody else. So it was very engaging. The only time he had, he pulled out a projector on the second day just so he could show the Scrum Alliance website and walk you through how you were going to register your certification and take the test. Because I think there were a, 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 what, we're just starting the test at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so that was part of it. He's just really a hands-on um, instructor. So I really learned by doing. The other th opportunity was Chris actually was just on the verge of becoming a CST. So he was he had a CST in the room who was the, cert, the, the, the person who was the official certifier. Yeah. That CST was Jeff McKenna. Jeff McKenna is one of those lesser known names in the Agile world, but he shouldn't be because he was actually on the first Scrum team. Worth um, knowing. He tells stories. Worth finding. About, yeah. Talking to him. Oh, yeah. He's, 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 he's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And so some of his insights and everything in his wonderfully cantankerous McKenna way really opened up the art of the possibility. And I literally went out of that two-day workshop 
going, I want to do this. This is what I want to be. And that like started, so. oh God, yeah. It was just, I couldn't get enough. I just, I started going to meetups. I started reading. I had the opportunity um, not long after that to take um, the coaching, coaching Agile Teams workshop from Lisa Adkins um, and got kind of involved in that um, and then just started growing and, and, and exploring. And it led me on a 10 year journey that um, culminated in me getting my Scrum Alliance certified team coach um, certification this year. And I'm still working to become like you, a certified Scrum trainer, because it's what I believe in and just a huge passion in what it can do. That's terrific. Now, sometimes I joke in my classes, you're now certified to know when you're not doing Scrum. And I'm, I'm looking for people like you, Joel, people that the lights go on. I think in two days, that, that's what you can get. It's, you get the piece of paper. That's, that's almost a certainty. But people that say, I have to pursue this. So that's great. And uh, I, I became a CST before the, the coaching program. Is there anything you'd like to say about that process of becoming a team coach? And by the way, congratulations. It's non-trivial work. I know that. Yeah, I think the progress, I mean, it's one of those things of, and I, I've known Howard Sublet, the chief product owner for the Scrum Alliance for several years. Um, he's actually, I've got one of those funny stories for, for Howard that I should tell you at some point, but. Um, oh, come on, reveal right here live. But, we'll send it to him later. I'm kidding. Well, no, he, know, he knows the story. It's the, well, uh, but it, it, it more of is kind of that, that journey of becoming a project manager from project manager into agilist. And I was very, very idealistic when I was first, when I was first doing this and I went very, very hardcore, like you've got to do it by the book and all of this and everything. And it was agile 2012 and Howard was working for big visible at that time. And they showed up big to the conference. And it was during the networking event and Howard's sitting there with a bourbon in hand, just whatever. And I just looked at him point blank and I, can you help me understand something? He went, okay said, how can you be a consultant in Agile? That just seems evil to me. And he paused for a long, long spell. And then he explained how Big Visible approached things and that they actually turned down client work when they knew that the client wasn't ready and how they went in to try and help organizations and sometimes organizations need this outside perspective to be able to actually see what they already see. And that was, I think the second great aha for me when I came out of um, Chris Sims's class was like, this is it. I want to do this for a living. When I came out of, of that conversation with Howard, it's like, wow, I want to do what he does for a living. And that was kind of when I started pivoting my path and started to look to how could I be, Agile coach, how could I help organizations, not just the company I'm in at the time? Uh, I see. So moving from project manager to scrum master and thinking, how can I spread this? It sounds like past my organization and yeah. maybe become a consultant. Yeah, it was, I think that was kind of a good dream aligned with my work dream. And my childhood dream was that the, when you were a kid, people asked you, what did you want to be when you grow up, right? Mm -hmm. And what were the, what are some of the common answers that, that, that kids would give when, when they were asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? I think fireman, that comes up. A fireman, lot. policeman, um, things like that. Um, I always gave the normal answers because I was pretty smart and a bit precocious when I was young. Okay, maybe I'm still precocious. <laughs> And I always gave the standard answers. Um, I think fireman was my leading one and astronaut. But in reality, what I wanted to be from the very earliest stages was I wanted to be a superhero. I wanted to save the world. Okay. And as I came into Agile and I discovered more about Agile and I met people like Howard Sublett and Diana Larson and Lisa Adkins, I realized that for the first time in my life, my dream of being a, a superhero and saving the world and my work coincided. And Super it was great. It was kind of around that time I talked to Howard that I came up with my own personal mantra that if I can help an individual be better, they will be a better team member. Mm -hmm. Better team members make for better teams. Better teams make for better projects, 
better projects make for more successful products. More successful products make for more successful companies and more successful companies can and do change the world. And so that kind of became my, my goal is like, I'm gonna help people be better in, on agile teams because that's gonna make companies better and companies will, will change the world. And we see this now with companies like Salesforce and their, the Salesforce Foundation, what yeah. Steve Jobs has done since he left Microsoft with the, sorry, um, Bill Gates has done since he left Microsoft with the Bill Gates Foundation. Um, yeah. And so that's kind of the background of my journey. That's been supported though by going back to that original question of Howard Sublet and what they've done at the Scrum Alliance to really create this learning, this continuous learning journey from being a CSM on. I mean, when in 2009, there was CSM and I think there was certified Scrum team, certified C. I don't remember. I don't. It, yeah, it was some remember certified when coaching. The coaching programs started. Maybe you remember? Yeah, because it, it was before, before they split it and everything. And I think it was um, certified Scrum coach, CSC. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, they've grown it. And now, um, when I help co-teach um, workshops, we can show people that next journey. It's like, okay, great. You've got just enough to know that there's more out there. What is it? We now have the advanced um, Scrum Master. We have the certified Scrum Professional. And then beyond that, we have what are called the guide certifications. And I love how the Scrum Alliance does it because CSM is considered a foundation certification. Mm -hmm. Foundation. It's nothing about, oh, you're going to be an expert. No, this gives you foundational level knowledge. Then we have advanced. Then we have professional. And then we have the guide level certification. Certified team coach, certified enterprise coach, and certified scrum trainer. And I kind of came along as this was, was gr growing about. And honestly, it was being at Applied Frameworks and working with um, some really great colleagues that I've got there including Jason Tanner and Carlton Nettleton, who worked on a, um, some great ad advanced and Scrum professional um, workshops that didn't exist when I became a certified Scrum professional. I actually took that stuff internally to better my skills. I didn't need to, I already had the certifications, but I took them because I wanted to get better at my skills. And that was it. Really becoming a certified team coach wasn't about, oh, I'm gonna become a certified team coach because it's a goal. It was, no, this is a recognition of my continued journey. And that's why I kind of continue on it is it's the it's giving me these milestones to know that I'm progressing in my my um goal towards mastery, which I will never never reach, but I will always achieve for. That's great. It sounds like really in that growth mindset these days, Joel. I'm wondering, wanting to be a superhero. First, sounds like you brushed past a few in your journey with Agile. Lisa uh, Atkins, yeah. Chris Sims, Lord Sublet. But my question is, what's your superpower? Uh, I think it's changed over time. When I was first doing this, um, I got the nickname, um, the Gorilla Coach because okay. of a blog I wrote, which was the whole thing came about because I I was never afraid to call out that the emperor had no clothes. It's like, I was the person that would always go, you know, there's this uncomfortable topic that everybody's avoiding. Why don't we talk about that? Let's go poke the bear. Um, and that, that, that came about- bear, in, Joel. Yeah. Good so it came out- a superpower. <laughs> well, you know what, superpowers, just because you're a superhero doesn't mean you're always super successful. I mean, look at Peter Parker, Spider-Man. I mean, he's always struggling to pay the rent. Super sure. superhero, but he was always struggling to pay the rent because he couldn't he he couldn't play the office politics of the Daily Bugle to be successful and become this lead photographer and and such. Okay. Um, but I, so for me, the gorilla concept is. It's part elephant in the room, that thing that nobody wants to talk to, and a part 800 pound gorilla that can leave your team crushed flat and wondering what bus they just got through under. Right. And so my superpower was really being able to come in and see that dysfunction. And I guess over time, and with a lot of coaching from, from some of those great superheroes I've seen um, in the past, I went from yelling out the emperor's naked to helping the organization to 
face the problem themselves, realize it and start 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 to to fix it. I guess the other superpower I guess I have is I'm really, really good at um, what you were talking about of that 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 aha moment, seeing that light turn on in people's eyes and who's going to be that next great scrum master. Um, for me, one of my greatest achievements ever is working with a client in Washington State came in and it was a 24 person scrum team. Mm -hmm. It's big. And we were helping them to break it down into two scrum teams plus a product owner and some people that were going to be helping the product owner. Mm -hmm. Am I coming through okay? Yes, absolutely. Okay, I got a, I got a, one of those Zoom things, your internet connection is unstable. Um, That's yeah. part of the fun of living in the real yeah. world. Now, fortunately, YouTube will fix all that once it's up. It might be a little jittery now, but we should be, we should be good long term. There was, there was a BA there and I, I talked with everybody on the teams and I went, you know, this person's interesting. And I had a gut, gut feel on it. And when we worked on the team designs, I asked questions of the managers as, as they were redesigning these teams as a good, good consultant. And I just asked questions and the managers started going, oh, interesting. And they chose this BA to be one of their, their scrum masters. And then I started working with this person and she just opened up and she just she kept asking all these questions and everything. And I remember it, we started using the big, uh, big physical um, um, task board on the wall and everything. And before the first week was out, she wouldn't let me touch the board anymore because it's like, no, no, our board, don't touch it. You're going to mess it up. And she just continued to excel. And even after I left the engagement, I stayed in touch with her and she went through, she survived director changes and kept the team going and kept the wall going. She ended up becoming one of the, the second agile coach ever hired by that company is still there, went on to get co-active coaching training, course training. To, at, at this point today, she is hands down a better coach than I'll ever be. And I'm just so happy that I was able to put her in a place of opportunity that she was able to go, yeah, this is what I want to do with my life. That's super great. Being able to seize the opportunity. And it reminds me, just like the superheroes you brushed past is superheroes like you, Joel, are easy to connect with in this space through the Scrum Alliance and this small agile community. I mean, the fact, for instance, we're both friends with Ainsley Knees. It's a small community. And yeah. I feel like we're all eager to help people have their own light bulb moment. That, that speaking of Ainsley Knees, yes, I, I agree with you. It's um, the the agile community is is small, even though it's global. It's walking in and meeting people that really get it and and, and understand it. And it's it's not just a process or whatever. It mm -hmm. is, is incredible and. The Scrum Alliance is making it so much easier these days to actually connect with those with those other people and the gatherings they have. Um, I have to admit, I was doing homework before before this, and I was watching. Um, I, I was fascinated to see what you and Vic had to say about the 2020 Scrum Guide because I've got my own opinions and everything on it. And I gotta ask you though, since you know Ainsley Knees, do you have an autographed copy of Liftoff? I don't. Ah. I have a copy. I see. Yeah. You do, I do. I do. Guy. Autographed from from her, she signed, signed it in a Vietnamese restaurant and, and gave it to me um, back when I was still in the Bay Area. Gotcha. I just I remember your 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 little thing with with um, Vic about the Kent Beck autographed book. That's right. It was back during my Yahoo days when I was in the Bay Area too. I still use Liftoff every time <laughs> I go to charter a team. I find that's a Great book. Oh yeah. I have, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. One, we could explore that, team chartering, lift off. And the other I'm wondering about is in your pursuit of becoming a coach, uh, you mentioned co-active coaching. 
what coaching frameworks really resonate with you? So I don't have any any of the so there's the ICF, um, ICF, uh, International Coaching Federation, ORSC, um, the systems coaching um, ones. I don't have any of those. I self-taught um, in part thanks to Lisa Adkins and the incredible work that she's done and built in, in the courses that she's done. Um, once I have finished my pursuit of becoming a certified scrum trainer, I really think I wanna look into ORSC, the systems coaching, because as I work more as being more and more working with the enterprise and helping enterprises to, to make those changes, the, as we move into more business agility, I'm finding that that system, coaching the system is almost more important than coaching the individual. So it's, and which is interesting as I try and justify that with my, 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 per, my mantra of team, teams to, to better companies, but still it's that, that, looking at the system and how can you help the system to work better? Because if you just help the one individual, that's great, but one individual can't change a whole company. Um, and one, in, well, one individual at a small level can't change a whole company, but one individual at like the VP level who comes in and says, oh, this is all rubbish, can make an entire transformation fall apart. Absolutely. So how can we coach the system to make the system resilient to um, that resilient enough that it's learning from everybody, not just that one, uh, we like to joke about hippo, highest paid person's opinion in the room. That's right. Well, there's a, you know, saying about a lot of the problems are actually systemic, right? It's not a bad person, it's a bad system. And if you want people to look better, change the system. I think D. Hawk, founder of Visa, talks about lots of bureaucracy just makes everybody look stupid. So yeah. it does make sense to focus on the system. Now, I don't know much about Orisk. Do you have some highlights or bullet points on that um, system? I, 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 will have, I will have to beg off. It's one of those, uh, the it's fascinating to me. And then knowing that I don't know enough yet that I want to go and pursue it. And I guess that's one of the big things about the way we do things is the there's always that next, what do I want to learn? What do I want to discover? Um, who do I want to learn from uh, on that? So I, I will admit that when it comes to, while well, I am a certified team coach and I can take the coaching stance and I'm really good with, uh, with that um, on a one-on-one, -on -one, there are people that are far better people coaches than I am right now. Whereas I know if it comes to trying to figure out the dysfunctions of a scrum team and how to get a scrum team operating well, I got that. I know that. I know that well. Um, when it comes to teaching concepts, I can teach, I can teach them in my sleep at this point. Uh, so I know my weakness and, um, a co old coworker of mine, William Rowden, um, he worked, um, for Solutions IQ. He, he had this great question that always made me think, and is now I, I continue always thinking and his question in the interview was, what's your learning edge? Hmm. And I loved how the way he put it, cause it was the. Where's that place where you you don't know uh, it yet, but you you are working on it because that's something you want to know more. And for me, that's my learning edge is that is really deepening my people coaching and becoming more like Michael De La Maza or um, Lisa Adkins or David Chilcott from the San Francisco Bay Area um, agile coaching space. Yeah, and I think Lisa Adkins, her work. That's based on coactive coaching. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. That's my yeah. It's based on coactive coaching. Um, she she partnered up with people from actually ICF um, when she was first building her training program. What's her program like? I had a real early look. I think in two thousand eight, two thousand nine. I always try to have a coach, and Lisa approached me at one of these scrum gatherings and said, what do you think? Would you like to try this coaching? I was like, yes, absolutely. But that's all I know. That was coach. before the book and everything. You had Lisa as a coach? I did. Oh my. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you. <laughs> so the beginning was before the book. I feel like I was a prototype 
mentee or something. <laughs> yeah. To work it out. Well, I mean, <laughs> grabbing a book, I bet. Yeah, there coaching. It is. I mean, this, this, I, as a certified team coach, I get a lot of people coming to me and going, Hey, I want to, I want to continue this journey. Where can I go? And I always start with, it's like, read this book. When you've finished reading this book, then go read the Phoenix project mm -hmm. and then come back and talk to me. Um, because while I know that I can learn so much more if I go off and I went to the ICF and got a coaching certification there or Oros and got a coaching certification, Lisa really opened the mind to, to mindfulness and really the, the thought about it. And for me, I was really struggling because this was, I don't remember when the PMI ACP came out, um, but I was actually one of the first 500 pilot members that took, took the test and became, so I was one of the first 500. And Lisa's book was one of the, the suggested re reading back then. And then it was just here, here's 12 books we recommend you read before taking the test. I read most of them. Uh, reading Lisa's book really helped because I was really struggling at that point because I was still a project manager, a program manager, but I was trying to work in an agile mindset. And I was like, this is never going to work. I don't know how I'm ever going to get there. And in an early part of Lisa's book, she talks about her experiences as a project manager. I mean, she was a very, very successful project manager. I think she was doing governmental stuff. I mean, yeah. I mean she was handling million dollar budgets and she is self-professed type A control freak. Um, project manager and then she writes this book and she's become like this thought leader in agile coaching and women in agile and she's just this incredible thought leader and it's like okay if she can do it and i can if she can recondition from project program management joel can too yeah. is that it? <laughs> yeah project to people that's interesting i like that quote yeah what really hits me about that is it's not the rules and getting the project done it's a much deeper connection with people and i would think that's where a lot of that mindfulness comes in too yeah it's um for me i mean so much of what drives me as an agile coach are things that have come from from outside of the agile space um so things like Dan Pink's drive, um, Marquette's turn this um, ship around, um, Abramoff's It's Your Ship, uh, Start With Why from Simon Sinek. But one of the things I really see is this concept that we go all the way back and it was it was shareholder value and oh, shareholder value. And then we went to um, customer value. Mm -hmm. And if you if you create value for the customer, you're going to create value for the shareholder. I think we're we're kind of on the uh, on the verge of the next great leap, and that's moving to employee value. Let's say if you if you focus on the value to the employee, they will then create more customer value, which will then in turn create more stakeholder value. And I really think that um, Lisa and and Michael Spade have really been at the forefront of that that drive into the more humanistic space around agile. And you're right, it's, it really is about the people, which kind of goes back to Jerry Weinberg's um, Secrets of Consulting, everything's a people problem, um, which is interesting because then you look at the system and it's like, well, there's system and then there's exactly. people problem, but it's like, well, yeah, the system problems are caused by people. And so how do we figure out that, that big loop? And so it's, I guess it's fascinating. It's just a big Gordian knot to try and start to unravel as we move past I mean, we're moving to this coming February. It's going to be 20 years since the Agile Manifesto was signed. There's no question that Agile isn't here and here to stay now. So now it's the, okay, great, where are we growing and how is it moving? And it's it's moving from being in the development team to kind of the space where I know you and I work a lot is with product owners mm -hmm. to now we're starting to see the growth in business agility of we're finally working with the senior directors and the VPs and the, the CTO uh, C-suite level of what do we need to change at that level to get that that business agility traction? I mean, it's actually a place I got to give props to Scaled Agile and Dean Leffingwell is the recent stuff they've done to bring in the whole um, seven competencies of business agility. Um, you can't argue with that. It's, these are the things that if you, if you're not thinking about these, 
with a foundation of that lean agile leadership, all of this wonderful stuff we can do with scrum teams is going to just fall apart because you need to have that systemic leadership support so that will allow you to continue to um, crank the flywheel, as Jim Collins says. Right. Question then, employee value. Now, I'm thinking quality of work life. When you say that employee value, what does that really mean? Uh, for me, that goes to Dan Pink's um, autonomy, mastery, purpose. Um, and if anyone who's listening to this doesn't know who Dan Pink is, just you're on YouTube now, type Dan Pink and RSA, and there's a great 10 minute video about it. Um, it's about creating that space and that environment. Um, and it goes to, I'm always horrible with my principles. Um, Quick, what's number eight? <laughs> uh, sustainable pace. Say, oh, see, it's, I didn't know. Bernie, Bernie Maloney gets on me on that one all the time because uh, I'm not good at sustainable pace. Um, <laughs> another great scrum trainer from the Bay Area. Um, the the one about build 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 um, build build around uh, motivated people, give them the environment and everything of success, and then basically get out of their way. Um, and that's the the concept is knowledge workers, um, and I think this goes to uh, Drucker says something along the lines of. Knowledge workers are people who know more about the process than their managers do. And it's the, look, I just hired a software developer and I'm paying him $150,000 a year. Maybe I should trust him to figure out how to solve the problem I've just given him instead of telling him what I want him to do like mm -hmm. he is a factory worker. Right. And that's the autonomy and mm -hmm. part of it. I would think too, in that situation. So we're talking a little bit about intrinsic motivation, right? And this idea, if you leave me alone, I have the skill and I understand why I, I'm motivated yeah. from within. Now on that skill part, that's one place I really see for the career of a manager to help upskill the people that work for them and, and help them get that skill part for the motivation. Absolutely. In fact, actually, one of the tools that I have used over the years that has been incredibly valuable to me is completely outside of the Agile space. And it's um, a series of podcasts that's been going on for well over a decade um, called manager-tools.com. And it's by two uh, former West Point um, grads who both went into business and then got together and have a management consulting firm. And it's their entire thing is about how to bring the people aspect back into management and how can the effective man manager. So um, we have the effective executive and I'm blanking on the author for the effective executive. Is that, that's Drucker, right? You know, I'd have to look it up and we'll throw tons of links in the description yeah. afterwards too. Yeah, but um, uh, manager tools has this concept of the effective manager and how do we get back to the, the true purpose of a manager. And I love the way um, their principal, Mark Horseman states, it's like the, the number one job of a manager is to get their people promoted. Like, and if, if you're not doing that, then you're not helping them. It's, and I actually kind of took that when I go into teaching, because I teach a lot of non-certified classes and then I co-teach a lot of certified classes with, with um, scrum trainers. Mm -hmm. And people always wanna, it's like, well, what about managers on the teams or whatever? And how does a manager compare to a scrum master? And the analogy I like to give is that each, scrum masters and managers both have a time box and a focus. A scrum master's time box is approximately six weeks, the next three sprints, if we're using standard two-week sprints. Sure. Um, not standard, it's the most common sprints out there. Um, there's a CST on the TAC that's watching this, I know. <laughs> Um, but so a, a scrum master's um, focus is the next six weeks or time box is the next six weeks. Their focus is the team. Does the team have what they need? Is mm -hmm. the team blocked by anything? It's always the team. Yeah. A manager's time box is six to 12 months, whatever yeah. the employee review cycle is at their company. Sure. Their focus is the individual. 
does Bob have what he needs to be successful? Does Bob know what he needs to do next to get promoted? Does Bob have the right training? Does Bob know what his resources are available to him? And that's kind of part of how I started to help managers as I moved into agile organizations, because the air, the, there's, that, there's this layer of who are the people that are still detractors from, from agile? And I don't find when you explain agile correctly to a, um, a CTO or a CIO, I can help you improve your predictability. We can help improve your productivity. They're all in. They're all the in. teams. We're going to let you work and figure this out. They're going great. I'm all in. I'm in. But it's yeah. the, the people managers and the project managers. Project managers are scared because what's going to happen to my job? The people managers are scared because what's going to happen to my job? Yeah. Um, and the irony is that the managers and the scrum master is becoming in conflict because each thinks that the other is taking their jobs. And that's why I really started to work on, let's move there. And so when I'm working with, when I'm coaching managers, the two things I give them is I tell them, go read the Phoenix project. It yeah. will show you what is possible. Mm -hmm. And then go listen to the manager tools basics podcast series. It's about 20 podcasts about uh, the manager tools, Trinity, which in true Douglas Adam fashion has four things in it. Of course. Um, Great. But that's my big advice is if you are anywhere in people management in the agile space, go to managertools.com and look at their basics podcast because the tools there, it's how to do employee one-on-ones, how to do reviews, how to coach and mentor them in becoming better employees, how to start in how... What do you do in the first 90 days when you're in an organization? What do you do in the second 90 days? And those tools really turned my career around. And then I've used them as one of those places I reach as an agile coach is it's knowing what tools to pull in from outside. Because I mean, as you and Vic were just talking about um, last month, Scrum's just a framework. What are all the things that you're gonna use to make that framework? Batteries not included, sense of, poly skill, looking outside of Scrum, of Agile, finding different methods, practices, coaching stances to help equip others. The Agile mindset of doing it and helping others do it. I'm really picking up from what you're talking about here tonight. Yeah. I remember when I was I was studying for my first um, appearance at the TAC, which for folks is the TAC is the Trainer Acceptance Committee. It's the the I never of, knew uh, I was on it and didn't know what those three letters Trainer Acceptance Committee, I believe, is what it is, or Approval okay. Committee. Um, but there they there are the certified Scrum trainers that are all volunteers that review applicants and say yes, they're ready. They should be a certified Scrum trainer. Uh, I was studying for that, and one of the questions you get is, "What was the, what's the last book on Scrum you read?" And I get this, and I, I had flashcards, and I get that one. It's like, well, hell, I don't know the last book on Scrum I read, but the last book that inspired me to add in in my work with Scrum was X, mm -hmm. because so many of the books that I've read in the last couple of years have not been directly Scrum related. Um, it's been expanding beyond um beyond that what where is the next horizon so that i can help be as they say as a guide level um, um scrum alliance um coach i should be going out ahead and where where are the next trends where is that next resource what's going to help you to solve this problem and it sounds like one of the things you're seeing trending I am too. It's this idea, business agility. Second time now in my career, I've been asked to come in and slow product development down. The rest of the organization organization can't keep up. Like, no, yeah, let's try something else. And it's really encouraging to see that, to see it expand. And it's, I think all these other things we're talking about that makes that work. You've mentioned so many books, Phoenix Project, Turn the Ship Around, Coaching Agile Teams. Any more you want to throw out there? What's those? But 
we'll save that for later. Yeah, what's I can't a, help you on the Netflix next right now because um, finally, after a very lean year, we had a really good December, and I treated the family to Disney Plus, and we're currently going through the Marvel Cinematic Universe from the in chronological order. Wow, um, that should keep you busy. But I need a yeah, book, Joel. Um, what what but, book should yeah. I read? Should I? I could pick up Marvel comics. I don't know well, I, I'd be interested in maybe bouncing off of you. It's like it, um, at different levels. If you're working with an executive, what would you? What would be the top three books you would recommend? For me, it would be uh, the Phoenix Project, um, and then depending on the person, either turn the ship around or it's your ship. Um, turn the ship around gets a huge amount of press, and I can't argue. Uh, um, the stories about, about, about the Santa Fe and Abramoff are just great. And he tells a really great story, but I actually find, um, turn the ship around, um, sorry, Marquette is turn, um, it's turn, turn the ship around is about the sub. Um, the one by Captain Abramoff is about a destroyer that went from being one of the worst in the fleet to the best in the fleet, um, or missile frigate. And it's just, it's very compelling because for him, it was people came to him with problems and went, okay, it's your ship. And so many of the things that the, the, the crew came up with became standard. Like they hated painting the ship. Okay, it's your ship. How are we going to do this? Well, you know, the single biggest problem with painting the ship is the rust that comes off the bolts. Really? How would we solve that? Could we get stainless steel bolts? I don't know. Let's find out. And they couldn't get them from the Navy, but they went out and out, got them off, uh, off site. And suddenly the, 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 the amount of painting the ship needed just dropped drastically. The Navy now uses the stainless steel bolts throughout, the, throughout their ships. Um, so it's really, I find it as a great example of how a leader can empower the how to the team. You came, and, and it's not just, the leader wasn't even giving problems. It was the, you got a problem, okay, great. How do we fix it? I think I need to read that. It also reminds me uh, when on Agile teams, we start to learn we sink or swim together. It's really dumb to say, hey, holes on your side of the boat. So this idea of it's your ship. We're living on this ship. How yeah. do we make it better? So I think that just moved up my book backlog list. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, and that, I mean, really, those are the two biggest books I recommend to leaders who are going into Agile. And then it's the, don't read a book on Agile. Come, come give me four hours or eight out of, hours of your time and do some exercises with me. Um, so get just hands on. doing, yeah, just hands-on exercises, which um, I've learned how to do remote. And so the two biggest ones that I, two biggest things I would say that I, I wanna teach a leader I can teach them in less than 45 minutes. One of them is any, pick your choice of multitasking exercise. I have, um, I prefer the one that's the three columns, the letter A, the number one, the Roman numeral one, um, because everybody can participate in that one. And then um, the penny game. Yeah. Just getting, doing, doing those two exercises wrapped around some principles just suddenly opens up so many, I, I've seen, managers and leaders eyes just totally open and they just suddenly they stop pushing and they go okay work on everything at once it's like no 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 no. let's just get the small piece of value let's see what it is and and that's part of why i love the phoenix project so much it's just hands down it's the i'm really to the point where i think when i start going to client sites again i'm just whenever i go to a new engagement i'm going to buy a stack of 10 10, 10 copies it's like here read this don't want to read it okay fine i'm going to go find somebody who will that makes sense. We're getting very close to being out of time. I want to oh, check wow. and see if we have anybody with questions. No, but that's okay. So back to you, Joel. Well, so I, I want to flip it around and ask you, because I, I realize I've been talking a lot, which is one of my, um, my superhero weaknesses as I can just, I will. It's your kryptonite. Talk. Yeah, it's my kryptonite. I, 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 why, why say use ten words when I can use a thousand? Uh, what are your go-to books? 
my go-to books. Uh, oh, he's going to. Two. It's so dense. That's why it's like in arm's reach. So much math in here. That's all wrinkled up. You know, all of these principles. But this is definitely a good one. Now, talking with Mr. Reinertson, another military guy, I asked him, what's the one thing I should take from this book? And he said, build the economic model, find your cost of delay so that you can figure out, should we release early with bugs or wait for something that is more production ready? If you understand cost of delay, it'll help you a ton with prioritization. And then just things like, if you limit your work in progress, you'll actually get more things done. And there's math behind that. So it really helps me to advocate in organizations to have such a like scientific grounding in what helps flow our product development. So that's a big one. Uh, try to think I, I, last book. Yeah. Honestly, before the pandemic, I was flying a lot. I was listening to books more than reading them. And uh, there is Mahaley, I can never remember his last name, but on flow again and creativity. I found that to be uh, really good books. And then there was one on uh, hyper-focus. And I, I took some of the tips and tricks from that, like dedicate one device to work. Don't put any fun stuff on it, put work stuff on it. Have another device that's dedicated to fun. Don't put any work stuff on that. So you can really focus in on, on whatever it is at hand and work distraction-free, not be like, oh, I'll just check on Twitter as long as I'm right here. You know, I, I would agree with that. Um, Flow is actually on my li my next to 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 read because I've been really looking at scaling. It's very important to understand you and maybe it's a future guest. Is are you familiar with the work by Troy McGinnis? Vaguely, not really. Uh, he has done some incredible stuff around Monte Carlo, um, around batch flow and cycle times and predictability models and I think. A science, a math guy before he got into agile, um, he would that, do that. But I think a great is talking about that separation. I love that the work machine. I don't have a separate work machine, but I do. I keep uh, web address. I put on uh, either a polo shirt or a button-down shirt. I come to my office, yeah, office, and I work. Mm -hmm. When I'm done for the day. I get up, I leave the office, I change. Wow. I even can change, sometimes I even change my shoes and this computer stays plugged in. I have another laptop because I had to get a new laptop to be able to do all this online training. It stays here. If I want to do anything that's not work related while I'm sitting at the work clothes and it's how I really separate home from work when this place and have been for yeah that's a really good trick and work from home i think people dream that that much about you could keep up it tends to talk to really way so all of these separations sounds like helps not only keep, to keep the quality of work life high but to make sure you stop the work and actually just the live from home part. So I, I like those tricks. I'm going to go change my shirt here in a minute, I think. <laughs> it, it, it really helps with the market. Also, when I'm walking through the house, mm -hmm. like I walk to the kitchen to get some food, I'm wearing a button-down dress shirt. My wife knows, oh, he's still working. Yeah. T-shirt, she goes, okay, here. here. <laughs> I was going to say, honey, got a minute? Yeah. Uh, any big plans coming up? For the new year, uh, no. Um, I think it's gonna. Uh, we we tend to new year, um, and we're really cautious and hope we're we're all pray, praying well for all all these different vaccines to make effect. Um, I think how we work will will 